presidential candidate Rand Paul is telling it like it is on the campaign trail, taking on his GOP rivals, Hillary Clinton, her husband Bill, as well as gun control. So everyone, please welcome Senator Rand Paul and his lovely wife, Kelly Paul. You know, I have to ask you, though, before we get into this, how tall are you? <laughs> <laughs> this may surprise you. Yeah. You're six foot four. <laughs> no, you're not. Well, haven't you ever looked at the basketball program? Everybody that's 5'8 is 5'10. Everybody that's 5'10 is 6'8. So foot. you're going to answer. Ever, everybody, well, like you know, you I'm 5'8, but I think that, uh, this is serious. I think size matters. You do. I think the size of your brain matters. Oh, the brain. oh there you go. I like that. <laughs> your wife Kelly for 25 years, the size of her brain. I there think you you're go. a beautiful and intelligent woman, but you had some reservations initially about him running for, for president. So how did he finally convince you? Uh, there might have been some hypnosis involved. <laughs> <laughs> Bribery, uh, arm twisting. Uh, no, seriously, in the end, I just decided I didn't want to make any decisions based on fear of what could happen. Um, if you've watched the debates, if you've seen anything, you know, Rand has a different point of view from any of the Republicans, and actually including Hillary, a more yeah. reasoned foreign policy. He's not afraid to call out some of the mistakes that we've made in the past. And I wanted him to have his voice out there. I'm proud of him. I respect him for his ideas. And I didn't want fear or of the unknown yeah, to be the thing that stopped him. I mean, when you love someone, that's what you want. And you say she's everything you're not. How so? Well, some of that's pretty obvious. Um, you know, but she has a much better personality. We probably would have like two friends without her. And, and we have hundreds of them. We have so many friends we have to yeah. juggle them because they're so well liked. And uh, people report this. They say, oh, he's, he's grumpy or he's not happy to be on the campaign trail. I love the ideas. And if we were all at a dinner party, I don't care whether you're right, left, middle, I'd love discussion of ideas. And I can do it in a, in a reasonable way, I think. But if you want to take me to a cocktail party and you ask me to come up with two sentences that mean nothing about nothing and then we're going to have an empty conversation, I'm just not that interested in that. So sometimes just greeting somebody for the first time, I'm maybe not that good at it. But I love, uh, you know, I was at a senior center yesterday and we had a great debate about Social Security reform. I'm happy to mix it up, you know. But, well, let's uh, jump into some of those hot topics. So the president broke down in tears yesterday talking about his plan to curb gun violence. And you have said that you're going to fight him tooth the nail on it and so I am so eager to hear what problems you have with the president's plan. Well, you know, I think if you ask Kelly or I, how did we react to the shooting of children? It's like anybody else, horrified at that, to think that our kids could go to school and be shot. So I think whether you're on the right or the left, we all have the same sense of recoil at the horror of this. My main opposition to this is constitutional, that laws are supposed to be write it, written by the legislature. And you say, oh, that's no big deal. The Congress won't do what they're supposed to do. Right. The problem, though, is, is if we allow the precedent of a Congress not passing laws and the president doing it, you might get very dangerous things like, let's say, internment of the Japanese or, let's say, spying on all the civil rights leaders or spying on the Vietnam War protesters. It's done. That's what I mean. But it's all done because of too much of executive power. The checks and balances are incredibly important to me. And uh, Montesquieu was one of the philosophers that our founding fathers looked to. And he said that when the executive begins to legislate, that a form of tyranny will ensue. But if you were in his position, what would you do? He can't seem to get any traction. He can't get he any... He has to come to Congress. He, he has to come and talk to us and, and try to work it out. And he some of it's difficult. That? He hasn't done that? Some. I mean, I've worked with him on criminal justice reform, and I've been to the White House, and I've applauded some of the things he's done with uh, commuting sentences of people who have been put in jail forever for nonviolent crimes. Right. But with regard to this, the difficulty is background checks. I don't object to background checks. And you just say, well, why don't we close the loophole of the private transactions? So they did that in California. They closed the loophole, and it's illegal to have a private transaction. Yeah. But in San Bernardino, it still happened. Why? Because in order to police private uh, transactions and have background checks, uh -huh. you would have to know where all the guns are all the time. And so what we fear is not the registration. I think you'll find this from most pro-gun people. We don't fear the, the, background, uh, the background checks. We fear that you would have to register all guns in order to know if, if to have a background so, check. I just want to ask you this because I'm a gun owner. You know, I don't mind that you know that I have a gun. You can come in my house and look for you. You can get off whatever you need. I don't understand why anyone objects to getting rid of automatic weapons. Automatic weapons, they're not for hunting. They do nothing. They're not, they're only there to kill. And you'll notice that a lot of the things that have happened happen with automatic weapons. When we see that, why don't we say, you know, who really needs to have one other than people who are at, mm -hmm. at war? Right. Yeah, what is 
Truly automatic weapons we don't have. You know, we banned truly automatic weapons, I think, in 1934. Right, but we still got a lot of them, right? Come yeah, on, well, what we have is not automatic weapons, so we have semi-automatic. So they fire in a fairly fast sequence, but you can't pull the trigger and they come like a machine gun. Those are, okay. those are no longer but out. But you know what I'm saying. Yeah. You know what, what it is, saying. is that there's a, a repetitive fire. Uh -huh. People do hunt with them, and people do also uh, shooting and sport shooting and uh, target shooting and things with these guns. And come to Kentucky, and I'll introduce you. To there are a lot of people who like and enjoy this as a sport. Sport. But the other problem is, is if we're going to take away ownership of specific types of guns, you really have to modify it. something that big as to either be legislation or even possibly a constitutional amendment. We can't allow one individual to do it. And here, I'll give you an example why. Let's say we had a terrible president that you didn't like from another party, and that president said, the view, oh, you should hear the things they're saying on the view. We should limit their speech. We should register the journalists, and then we should have an approval board. And you know, we, that's silly. We would all be opposed to that. But that's the danger of letting a president make the rules. Even if you agree with what he's doing now, you should worry about having a president have so much power to create the law without he's Congress doing it. He's going in a couple. I, I'm yeah. sorry, man. There's no reason anybody needs to have an automatic weapon. I'm sorry. I, I get everything else. Yeah. Because I want to get to this for sure. Kelly, you uh, have written a book and you talk about the ups and downs of the campaign trail and what gets you through those more difficult times. And those are your best friends. And so you've written True and Constant Friends. And I want you to tell us about uh, those friends and, and what your book is all about. Well, the book is about six women that I've been friends with for from the very first week of my freshman year in college. And so we've known each other since we were 18 years old. And, you know, we've been through every stage of life together. We're now all 52 years old. And we've met every year for a reunion weekend since, uh, since we graduated in 1985. We live all over the country. None of us even live in the same city. And so that connection, that sort of touchstone every year has been such a support system to me. We're all very different. We have different points of view. I mean, it's much like this. You just yeah. have this yeah. incredible sounding board. But down deep, we just had this amazing core respect and love for each other. And, and that's just been so powerful to me. And I wanted to, to write about that friendship, but I also wanted to write about who inspired us and who made us who we are. And so the book goes back as much as 100 years with each friend. I write about my grandmother, and then I have them tell me stories of the women in their lives who really made them who they are. And through the experience of writing that book, I learned so much more about these friends that I never would have known otherwise. Well, we want to thank you guys. I know that's well, one more thing about the mock turtleneck sweaters that oh, you wear. You're, apparently, we gave us those today, actually. I just worn it today. Yeah, but but I was told I couldn't wear it. What do you, Mrs. <laughs> Mrs. Paul, what do you think about them? <laughs> just a yes or a no. Uh, it's a good luck, but we just want to say thank you for being great sports. You guys are a lovely couple. Best of best of luck on the campaign trail. Everyone, a big round of applause for Senator <laughs>